and shoot, you know, with facilities like ours, good user interaction, review of their code, helping them, making sure that they have, you know, solid code that once it's launched onto the system is actually going to complete the solution. That's why I tend to make it as the number one in the energy efficiency loading order, because that is pure waste. Now, if you just let your system over to inexperienced users, they're going to be uh, trying to get their solution through trial and error. And, and uh, on a facility like ours, where they're not paying the energy impacts for that, it's really important to uh, foster and, and assist them to make sure that you know, you've know you got as reliable and robust code going up there as possible. And we have 7,000 users around the world. Wow. So uh, at any given time, we have um, 800 to 1,000 users on the systems wow. at once. So it's a very, very, <laughs> it's at a scale of, um, and even with that, you can't, you know, there are plenty of, of failed jobs, yeah. but we try to minimize them as much as possible. Very early on in nurse history, uh, it, it became apparent that, that the way nurse was set up, that the, its mission ought to be the advancement of state-of-the-art scientific computing in all respects. And gradually over the years, and especially since they decided to move back up onto campus from our Oakland location, and we should make it a world standard energy efficient uh, data center. And, and that's where uh, the, the three loading orders comes in uh, that I have for energy efficiency, ensure compute jobs complete to solution as number one, and number two, site specific facility design, because Berkeley is, has such a mild climate and uh, with proper design that we could actually have uh, a top 500 uh, or top 10 level HPC da data center that would not need any vapor compression cooling. And wow. that's what was designed. So what, what in that, in that design that's unique to um, being at Berkeley, what, um, what are some of the elements that are unique to your location? Well, it never really gets too hot. Um, uh, do you, if you understand the difference between dry bulb and wet bulb, um, you're in Perth, so it's not very humid there, is it? No. Yeah, right. So you understand the dry heat. It's yeah, yes. but it's a dry heat, right? You have uh, opportunities to clean to cool yourself off when you have a dry heat through evaporative. And this is not a vapor, comp uh, you know, compression cooling technology. Uh, the annual um, number of hours, uh, the, the, well, first of all, the peak design uh, wet bulb temperature for Berkeley is about 72 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it's a pretty mild um, uh, 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 temperature and the relative humidities are, are very moderate. Uh, we tend to have high humidities when the temperature is really cold as the cool uh, uh, fog comes in off of the bay. And we have a west exposure with the prevailing winds bringing air off of the bay. So we have a slight amount of, 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 um, of salinity in the air as well. But so we don't have that peak wet bulb temperature in conjunction with high humidity which gives us the opportunity during those warmer periods to use evaporative cooling. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I, think, I think the number of years or uh, hours uh, in a year at uh, 72 uh, from, our, from our, our, our design bins is ridiculously low, something like uh, 20 hours, less than 20 hours wow. during the year. So most of the time we're in the, um, in the 60s uh, during the cooling season. And uh, with, with those temperatures, our air-cooled equipment under the new ASHRAE um, A, A4 regimes, you know, uh, it gives us the ability to just do single pass outside air. And uh, we can actually do um, some pr 
pretty significant cooling with that and and we managed to keep all of our air cooled equipment going so as a result uh, in effect what we have is direct evaporative coolers for the room air or just straight outside air economizing which is sometimes being called free cooling but i take issue with that term because it's not free fans use a lot of energy <laughs> and then the e indirect evaporative cooling which is the cooling tower that's fantastic uh basically we're able because of our location and our mild climate we're able to reject as much of our heat out to the environment as directly as possible and um, um and and we're able to maintain operation Nice. Okay. Uh, um, so we've 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 touched on a little bit of how you're doing all of this. Can you tell me why green HPC is a priority for you? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, Lawrence Berkey Lab, as an ethic, is concerned with all um, energy efficient. Well, the the discovery of new energy um, uh, sources and 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 methods and the efficient use of all resources in general. And um, you may not know, but uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab itself in another division, a division that I came out of, uh, which is called the Energy Technologies Area, uh, back in the late 70s, pretty much um, created the area of energy efficiency for buildings. Uh, with uh, uh, a person here in, in the United States, Dr. Arthur um, uh, Rosenfeld, who is regarded as the father of energy efficiency. He's the person that, that, that put together the science. And Lawrence Berkeley Lab has, um, has uh, basically propagated that ethic in all of the corners of research and operations. So Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and the UC system, we're part of the University of California, and uh, we are on a rapid uh, 2025 uh, a net zero energy uh, sustainability path. So in the NERSC mission statement, we're advancing the, the, art, uh, the state of the art in, in scientific computing at, at the computing level, as well as the facility level. And we collaborate with the with the division I mentioned and the Department of Energy, Federal Energy Management Program uh, to uh, disseminate and uh, share any efficient technologies that, that, we, uh, that we develop. Fantastic, and are there any cool ideas that you can mention that, um, that have come out of this? Uh, well, the, the third idea, I, I said I, I've, I've got three um, loading yep. orders. Uh, the, we talked about one and two, and the third is in, investing in operational tools and high resolution instrumentation. So um, that comes out of the ethic of the energy efficiency world, once again, uh, from my former division, which said, you can't manage energy uh, if you don't measure it. You, you got to measure something in order to manage it. And, and um, NERSC, with this new facility, came to the conclusion that every time we wanted to strike off a project, we would have to then first launch a, a data instrumentation project in order to gather the data to design the project. And then, um, then the project would be designed and everything would go through. And there was just long time, time lags. So they said, you know, geez, it'd be nice if we just had the data already. Then they also observed that in their previous uh, um, uh, operational uh, uh, lessons that when a problem occurred, almost always it was, man, I wish we had the data to understand exactly what went wrong. Sometimes we had it, other times we didn't. So when the new facility uh, was thrown up, uh, they turned everything on ahead and said, it's good with the amount of, of scientific results data that we store and the infrastructure that we invest for all of this storage, the cost to just instrument everything, just, just actually measure everything and store it. Um, we, they did an estimate that they said that uh, if 
if we did that, we would never consume more than 2% of the planned uh, storage capacity wow. of our tape drives. So um, they said uh, the, the downside is just not there. I mean, we'll have an upfront capital investment, but if we actually measure all of the power at all of the racks and all of the um, uh, the air in, in various locations, and we just highly instrument everything. And we created the Omni uh, platform, uh, which is operational um, uh, maintenance and networking information platform. We are just gathering all of that data. We are currently gathering something. Uh, I think we've got a ingestion rate of something like, I'm not the expert, it's 600,000 points per second. And um, so it's it's a huge amount of data that gets put in to a, 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 a real-time platform, a time series database. We use Elasticsearch, we use Prometheus Victoria metrics, and we can access it all in real time, near real time. It's uh, under a minute or, or maybe two minutes from uh, the put to being able to get it and display it in Grafana and web-based interfaces. And we keep all that data live for one full calendar year and then archive it into the tape drives. And so we have this living history in, in long-term tape drives, but most importantly, we have very high resolution performance data going back a full year, which we then feed into uh, many other uh, uh, diagnostic tools in order to look at the performance, tune our settings, and um, narrow in on energy efficient uh, um, uh, settings throughout the facility. And we feed those into uh, what we call in a, another group that I interface with the energy efficiency HPC uh, working group. Uh, we have a subgroup in there called operational data analytics. And we have a series of, of, of analytic tools that we use to analyze and um, go through um, uh, iteration cycles to to dial in our our settings, and then we watch the plant over prescribed experimental periods. Where say we we try to run the plant at a tighter uh, approach to wet bulb outside, and we watch it for two weeks, and then we adjust it to another setting, and we can look at these. Uh, uh, very detailed scatter plots of the baseline versus the experimental period. And through this iterative process, uh, we are able to dial into optimal um, settings in our cooling plant and are on, on um, the HPC settings and, uh, and improve the operation of our facility. So in, in, doing, in, in doing that, um, any successes and learnings? Um, some of the things that we did learn, um, the Cray XC system. Hey, you guys have a Cray XC. We do. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So you you essentially have, you've got just a, a sweet setup there. That I mean that <laughs> that is really good. You pull it up from the ground. You don't have a chiller to keep your your constant twenty one degrees C. So you're essentially operating with um, with a fixed uh, cooling water temperature like the Cray XC is designed uh, to have. Um, most other facilities will have a chiller to maintain that, that consistent capture, you know, dead band range for the cooling water temperature. Well, we don't have that. We have a cooling water temperature that actually varies with the outdoor wet bulb. And sometimes it actually gets pretty warm. And so, um, the, the cooling water temperatures will get up to 78, as I said, about 26 degrees C. That causes the Cray XC system to kind of rely on the, on the blower fans more. And, um, and because of that variability, that water, um, we, uh, we, uh, we looked at the feature. I don't know if you guys have enabled a dynamic fan speed control feature Not on your sure. system. So that's a feature where uh, Cray, that Cray put in through us. We actually interacted with them because Edison, our first machine, 
was just the fan energy was just a real hog. So we said, there's got to be a better way to manage this. Can we manage these fans based on the on the processor temperatures? And they put together an entire feature that is available in all Cray systems around the world called dynamic fan speed. And what it does is it looks at the processor temperature. And for every, I think it was every five degrees C or is it two? Five, I think five degrees C rise in temperature, it bumps up the fan speeds. So we had, uh, instead of the standard operation of three fan speeds, which was basically idle, um, uh, nominal, uh, or maximum, which was, I think it was like 3,500 and then 4,000. Uh, it now had... Uh, it, the dynamic feed gives you a whole range of 15 fan speed steps that that go up and down based on the on the CPU temperature. And then it also works in conjunction with the cooling water temperature in um, in, in 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 the cabinets for 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 the water temperature uh, that 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 the system sees. We decided to create we created a link between the cooling plant and uh, the um, and and the Cray system, so it actually looks at the average cooling water row temperature um, uh, of all of the cabinets. It looks at what the average cooling water temperature is, and um, and uh, it recognizes when that cooling water temperature has gotten. Um, uh, above the the cabinet uh, um, um, set point because it's a do you understand what's a what's a, a PID loop is a proportionally integrating mm. differential loop that's a standard um, servo loop that's a negative feedback loop that all mechanical and electronic and and any system that auto self regulates uses so um, it just it's negative feedback to a set point. And so uh, the, cool, the, the, the Cray XC system will, you will have a, a, a cabinet temperature set point of say, uh, it's usually three degrees C above the cooling water temperature. So for 21, you guys are probably operating on a 24 degrees C cabinet uh, uh, temperature, a uh, cooling uh, you know, cabinet um, uh, temperature. We've instituted a reset um, uh, uh, a, a reset script in our Cray XE that looks at the cooling plant. And when it sees that the outside air conditions are very, very cold um, and we can make cooler uh, water, say 17, 18 degrees C, it resets the cabinet temperatures down to those level so that the cool cabinet temperature will cause the CPU to run a little bit cooler, thereby causing the energy hog blower fans to step Reduces down in well. speed. Right. Wow. So take advantage of the moments when the outdoor uh, conditions allow for cooler cooling water temperatures that allows us to get some relief on the blower fans. And on those times in the hot period, summer days when we can't make cold um, 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 cooling water temperatures, well, then the blower fans uh, will cycle up to keep the computers happy. So um, these are the types of innovations that we're always searching for and um, in an effort to operate our facility as, as energy efficient as possible. That's awesome. That's awesome. So thank you so much for sharing all of that information. There's so much knowledge and, and, and really cool tools and ideas that, that you've shared today um, that I think a lot of people can take back and, 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 and use and, or hopefully, think about. Hopefully use yeah. and think about, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Norm. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, Aditi. I look forward to the day that we're uh, supercomputing all together in person again, and I, I can meet so. you. <laughs>